Welcome, everybody. I hope you all have your lunch. This is part of a series of talks on academic freedom organized by the Center on Law and Liberty, and it's generally generously supported by the Mailman Foundation, and today's event is co-sponsored by the Federalist Society. The Center welcomes speakers talking about academic freedom, and it particularly welcomes debate on the subject from all sorts of points of view. Some students have indicated an interest not merely in talks, but in full-fledged debates uh, with equal time for multiple persons standing up here, and I think that would be a great idea. I would love that. It's something that I've hoped for, but it's difficult to organize, so I want to take this opportunity to invite you to participate yourselves in helping to organize these things. If you have suggestions for speakers or topics of debate, on de to come talk to me. You can email me. You can come see me in my office. I would love to do that. The more you participate, the more fun this will be. Today's event is a talk by Casey Johnson on unlearning to process troubling trends on campus. Casey Johnson teaches at Brooklyn College and at the Uni City University of New York Graduate Center, and he's well known for his role in the Duke University lacrosse rape case. This led to his publishing a book, Until Proven Innocent, Political Correctness, and the Shameful Injustice of the Duke lacrosse rape case. He also has written Asia Pacific and the Age of Globalization and all the way with LBJ, the 1964 presidential election. The format is that he will speak for about 25 minutes, and then there'll be questions and answers. Thank you very much. All yours. Thanks for the kind words. Thank you all for, for coming. It's a delight for me to be here. My sister was a four-year starter for the Columbia basketball team, so I spent a lot of time on, uh, on campus. And today what I want to talk about is the, the development of, of a quite robust and really quite recent movement, both off campus from pressure and on campus, to weaken and in some cases eviscerate due process uh, rights with regards to sexual uh, assault. So I want to do two things and then I'll open up for, uh, for questions. First, give a brief background as to how we've gotten to this point, because the development really is quite recent. It dates from this uh, uh, letter from the Office of Civil Rights in 2011. And then secondly, uh, make some comments on why any of this should uh, matter. So the letter I have behind me was issued um, by the Office for Civil Rights, which is an agency of the Department of Education, uh, in 2011. Uh, it was most generously an expansion of Title IX, uh, less generously a reinterpretation of Title IX, to suggest that the federal government had authority to withdraw federal funds from uh, any college and university, which essentially is anyone, um, that uh, did not uh, alter uh, its uh, procedures with regards to the handling of sexual uh, assault complaints on campus. Um, and the Dear Colleague letter made a number of specific recommendations, uh, and in a couple of cases, specific mandates to colleges and universities. The two mandates were that colleges needed uh, to reduce uh, the burden of proof in sexual assault cases uh, to a preponderance of evidence threshold. There was wide variation uh, before 2011, but most elite colleges, Ivy League schools, elite uh, liberal arts colleges, high profile public universities, um, used a clear and convincing standard. Some schools used a beyond a reasonable doubt uh, standard. Uh, and secondly, the uh, OCR mandated uh, schools uh, to introduce uh, a right to appeal for accusers in sexual assault cases in the event of not culpable uh, findings. The operative theory uh, in terms of OCR statements and its defenders is that a campus sexual assault tribunal most closely resembles civil litigation and therefore civil litigation uh, standards are appropriate. But if you look at the bottom uh, requirement, this is something that we don't generally see in civil litigation, a strong discouragement to allow cross-examination by the accused student of the accuser. And since in many campus sexual assault uh, proceedings, the accused must represent himself. Uh, attorneys either are not allowed, or if they are allowed, they are not able to speak. Uh, this requirement effectively means that there is no cross-examination uh, in uh, colleges that accept the OCR's uh, standards. Similarly, uh, items that we think of as associated with uh, uh, civil litigation, mandatory discovery or testimony under oath are not present in uh, campus sexual assault uh, proceedings. So essentially the OCR mandate was to change procedures in such a way to make it more likely that you would get a culpable finding 
but not change procedures in a way that might create uh, a non-culpable finding. So what was the rationale for this? Um, it, it's a, uh, it was a policy that rested on two at, at least very dubious uh, assumptions. The first was a statistic, um, which has been used by the president, used by the vice president, used by the White House, used by OCR, used by prominent members of Congress who have pushed this issue, like Kirsten Gillibrand uh, and Claire McCaskill. Since I'm criticizing him, I should admit I am a quite partisan Democrat and was an Obama donor in 2008 and 2012. Very disappointed in his policy on this, uh, this issue, which is that one in five uh, women will be the victim of a sexual assault during their time on campus. This is a statistic that dates from a survey of two large uh, 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 public universities. It has relatively little standing in actual statistics. The, the, the chart that I have behind me is from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which shows a couple of things. First of all is that the prevalence of sexual assault has been declining uh, over the last 20 years, not rising. And secondly, despite what is the basic assumption uh, in uh, uh, the rhetoric from both the White House and from Congress, uh, the chances of an 18 to 24 year old woman being sexually assaulted is greater if she is not a college student rather than uh, if, uh, if she is. The statistic is also odd in another uh, respect. Um, what I think is the single best journalistic coverage of this issue came last year from Emily Yaffe in Slate. Uh, and she decided to actually address the question of what would an actual uh, rate of one in five women being raped look like. And she looked around the world and she found one instance uh, where this occurs um, in the Congo, um, where rape is used as a weapon of war. The typical college campus is not really the equivalent of the Congo. Um, and after this uh, piece appeared, it got a lot of attention. Um, the use of the one in five statistic dramatically dropped um, from politicians. Kirsten Gillibrand basically removed it um, from her website, and her spokesperson said that statistics don't matter on these sorts of things. But before the piece came out, statistics mattered uh, very much. So the first dubious assumption is that we need to change procedures because we're essentially facing an epidemic of violent uh, uh, crime. The second and far more, I think, dubious assumption is that colleges and universities are so hostile to fairly treating victims of sexual assault that the federal government needs to come in and place its finger on the scale uh, to change uh, the, uh, the policy. This is almost an Alice in Wonderland uh, interpretation. I suspect any of us can imagine a scenario in which a college or university may actually re-victimize a victim. Let's say if the suspect is a star quarterback um, at a big football school in the southeast, hypothetically speaking, of course. Um, or if the suspect is the son or the grandson of a large donor who threatens to withdraw funds uh, if his son or grandson is, uh, is prosecuted. But most students accused of sexual assault in college and universities are not star quarterbacks or are not sons or grandsons of multi-millionaires. Uh, They're typical college uh, students. And there are lots of other reasons um, why colleges and universities could be suspected, as they actually do, to tilt the scales, if anything, on, on behalf of the accusers. Um, on matters related to gender, um, the typical college faculty member or the typical college administrator is not exactly a far-right uh, 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 figure, basically any poll that you look at. And we have an example of this. Um, Despite what we've seen at UVA, the highest profile fake rape case came in, uh, in, in colleges in the last decade or so, came at Duke in 2006. Um, the accuser was, was almost a comic book, non-credible person. Um, she claimed alternatively that there were zero, two, three, four, five, six, and 20 rapists um, over a course of three weeks. She never told the same story uh, twice. Her last story had the, uh, a sexual assault occurring while she was being suspended in mid-air. Um, this non-credible story nonetheless uh, aroused strong support um, within the Duke uh, campus. 88 uh, Duke faculty members signed this statement uh, in which they said that something happened uh, to the accuser. The statement was issued a couple weeks after the case went public uh, and in which they thanked protesters who had, among other things, urged the castration of the captains of the lacrosse team. So this is not what you would expect from the OCR's vision of campuses that are resolutely hostile to accusers in sexual assault uh, cases. 
Duke responded to the lacrosse case by changing its sexual assault policies, uh, not to reemphasize due process, which they might have done, but to redefine what constituted sexual assault on the Duke uh, campus in two important ways. First, they argued that sexual assault could occur in, uh, with the result of perceived power differentials and an unintentional atmosphere of coercion. Those of you who are basketball fans, any sexual intercourse between, say, a member of the Duke men's basketball team and a freshman or sophomore woman could, in theory, fit under this definition of sexual assault. And secondly, they expanded the definition of sexual assault to include intoxication. This is a big issue currently in a lot of these uh, uh, proceedings. There's no criminal jurisdiction anywhere in the country that defines rape as intoxication in and of uh, itself. So what we've seen from colleges and universities in responding to the OCR letter is basically what you would expect from the Duke response, which is that they've taken OCR's mandate. Every university in the country has essentially dropped the, uh, uh, the, the, the threshold of evidence and introduced a right of appeal. They have to, otherwise they lose federal funds. But they've gone beyond what the OCR has ordered in significant ways. People like the Group of 88 uh, or the Duke administration at Duke. Duke is a typical campus in terms of its, uh, its structure. And I want to just briefly look at a couple of uh, policies. The first is the Stanford, uh, 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 excuse me, first is the Yale policy. Um, and at Yale, the, Yale is the first um, uh, school to redo its policy under the current uh, OCR. They did it a couple, redid it a couple of months before the Dear Colleague letter came out. And they introduced a two-track process for evaluating sexual assault uh, on campus. Accusers could file what was deemed an informal complaint. And under these procedures, the accused student does not have the right to introduce evidence uh, uh, to uh, challenge uh, the uh, allegations. And there are some students who have gone through this process who have claimed that they were not even told what the specifics of the allegations were. Now, there is a flip side to this. Um, a student branded a rapist under the informal complaint procedure cannot be punished beyond a simple letter placed in his file. He can't be expelled or suspended in, uh, in any way. And the allegation is supposed to remain secret uh, uh, down the road. Frequently, these have, uh, these have gotten out. And then in the formal uh, complaint uh, uh, process, um, Yale uses, and I'm quoting directly from a Yale document here, a more expansive definition of sexual assault uh, than in any criminal jurisdiction in the state of Connecticut. This, too, is common, a term sexual assault that most Americans have come to understand as meaning specific things. On college campuses, has come to mean something far broader uh, than uh, what would be criminal uh, rape. And then there's Stanford, uh, which has in, in, in some ways the more, most interesting policy. They just, they, in response to the Dear Colleague letter, they set, set up this thing called the uh, uh, Alternative Resolution Program, the ARP. Um, and the ARP set up the, the Dear Colleague requirements, lower the burden of proof, um, uh, grant a right to appeal. But they also did a couple of other uh, things. Previously at Stanford, before 2011, if you were accused of sexual assault, you could be found culpable only with a unanimous vote of the four-person disciplinary uh, panel. Stanford changed this to allow conviction on a three-to-one vote. There's nothing in the Dear Colleague letter that talks about unanimous or non-unanimous panels. This was a decision by uh, Stanford. And secondly, Stanford introduced training for people who serve as part of these panels. And among the training material, Stanford is the only university whose training material has leaked out. I've quoted a couple of, uh, of items. That uh, a, a sexual assault uh, uh, abuser will act persuasive and logical. Well, that's true. They, they could. But someone who acts persuasive and logical may also be innocent. This doesn't seem to have been considered by the Stanford uh, uh, training. Um, and panelists are, are told that they should be very cautious in accepting a man's claim that he's been wrongly accused. This would be the equivalent, say, in the criminal justice system if in rape trials, but only in rape trials, all juries were given special training material, but the special training material was provided solely by the prosecutor to make it more likely that the jury would come back with a guilty finding. And indeed, this is precisely what has happened in, uh, at Stanford. In the last three years, the number of students found culpable of sexual assault has increased by a factor of 300 uh, percent. Uh, and the architect of this plan, a law professor named Michelle Dauber, has celebrated this as, the, as a positive outcome uh, from, uh, from the ARP. And then finally, the third stage of this uh, process has been the encouragement by OCR of individual complaints 
um, by accusers. Columbia is one of the schools where a Title IX complaint has been filed with the federal government, which allows the OCR to investigate a university. These complaints, in turn, have uh, uh, created very substantial media coverage, especially in the Times, BuzzFeed, and Huffington Post, which have be between them have gone uh, uh, more than 100 articles on campus sexual assault over the last couple of years. It's a big issue. It deserves media uh, coverage. But these articles have a, a, a consistent and quite troubling pattern in that they don't describe the actual process that has triggered the complaints. And I suspect that most readers, if they read something in the New York Times saying student X has been accused of sexual assault, don't have a firm understanding of what the difference between a college disciplinary process is and a criminal justice process. They simply assume that the college process is more or less fair, um, uh, 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 which generally it's not. And all of this has then redoubled back. Um, sort of created a significant public pressure. The politics of this issue are very odd. If you think of American history over the last half decade, since crime has been a major issue in American politics, generally, and there are exceptions on both sides, it's the Democrats who have been more pro-civil liberties. It's the Republicans who have been more tough on crime, uh, you know, pro-victims' rights. That's not the case on this issue. This is an issue which is very strongly pushed by Democrats. And so in blue states, um, as this has gone down to the state level, there have been uh, uh, changes as well. California in uh, last year enacted an affirmative consent law that defines sexual assault for college students differently than in the criminal justice system. College students are required, required uh, to obtain affirmative consent throughout the process. And when asked how an accused student could defend himself, one of the co-sponsors, uh, Bonnie Lowenthal, who's now running uh, for mayor of Long Beach, uh, said, your guess is as good as mine. It was just a wonderful statement of legislative intent, which gave a sense of exactly how vague this policy uh, uh, is. Uh, and then in New York, uh, Governor Cuomo instituted last year by executive order an affirmative consent standard for public universities. He attempted to expand this uh, to all universities in New York, including uh, Columbia, uh, in his fiscal year 2016 executive budget. The legislature said no, in part uh, uh, in reaction to the very broad conception of sexual assault in the Cuomo uh, plan. What was striking about the Cuomo plan, and I've quoted from it a, a bit here, is that the words accuser, alleged, or complainant never appear in Cuomo's discussion of sexual assault on college. An accuser in Cuomo's interpretation of events is automatically a victim or a survivor. And in this scheme of things, under the law, there's almost no way to plead consent. The only way a student accused of sexual assault, if the Cuomo standard is adopted, could get off is to prove that someone else committed the sexual assault, because the accuser was already a victim. We've already established that a crime uh, occurred. All right, so why should any of us care? Um, despite the claims of one in five, the vast majority of students uh, on college campuses, the vast member, majority of members of the university community, graduate students, law students, faculty, will not be accused of sexual assault through a college tribunal. There are, I think, two reasons why uh, all of us should care about this issue and should, you know, should pay it more attention. Um, one relates to the theme of this uh, program, which is academic freedom. By far, the most significant pushback to OCR's effort came last year in this piece published in The Globe, an open letter signed by 28 current and former members of the Harvard Law faculty. Uh, which argued that the uh, program that was being pushed by OCR eviscerated uh, due process and violated the tenets that these professors taught in their classroom, but also argued that the plan um, threatened academic freedom by intruding on the government discussions about sexual assault-related issues on campus. Those of you who read The New Yorker, there have been a couple of pieces in there about students uh, arguing that rape law should either no longer be taught in law schools or should be taught in different uh, ways. But this, in fact, is broader. Um, the letter, in, uh, in part, fell back to this uh, uh, resolution agreement from 2013 um, between OCR and the University of Montana, which used this ominous word, a blueprint. Um, when the OCR got uh, blowback on this, they argued that the critical word in that first sentence that I've quoted was not blueprint, but A. 
uh, suggesting that it was a but not the blueprint, and therefore blueprint didn't mean something that would be applied to all colleges and universities, which is an interpretation that no one had until the, the issue got, uh, got attention. And OCR's definition of what constituted sexual assault or sexual harassment on campus um, in the Montana blueprint was frighteningly broad. Uh, abandon the reasonable person standard in terms of what constitutes sexual harassment and made clear that verbal conduct could trigger OCR uh, uh, sanctions. Some people call verbal conduct speech and generally, you know, we, we defend speech uh, on college uh, uh, campuses. And then finally, um, a, a third element of threats to academic freedom are, are somewhat harder to measure. I mean, it's always difficult to, to measure the concept of self-censorship, particularly in a kind of closed academic uh, community. But there is a kind of case study of that here. Um, Columbia has one of the highest profile uh, rape accusers in the current round of accusations. Uh, the student named Emma Sulkowitz, who has gotten a lot of media attention for uh, carrying a mattress around campus as part of a uh, a thesis uh, project. Um, and Sulkowitz has been very aggressive in doing interviews. She did interviews with The Spectator, with uh, local TV stations in New York, with MTV, with The Guardian, with The New York Times, uh, in which she claimed that she was uh, sexually assaulted by another Columbia student uh, named Paul Nongesser, um, and that Columbia mistreated her as part of this process. In all of these uh, uh, interviews, with the exception to its credit, uh, of the interviews with The Spectator, uh, the reporters with whom uh, Selkowitz uh, spoke did not seek uh, to speak to the person that she was accusing. Um, Kathy Young, who's a reporter for The Daily Beast, did so. Um, she published uh, a very uh, 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 well done uh, piece that at least called into question uh, the basics of Selkowitz's uh, uh, story. The most important thing that she had was she spoke to uh, uh, the, the graduate student who had served as the advocate, the, you know, the quasi-attorney, um, for uh, the student that Selkowitz accused. And the, and the graduate student said that Selkowitz was misrepresenting how the disciplinary uh, panel worked. In response, uh, the young piece uh, triggered this really quite interesting op-ed um, from the former op-ed director of The Spectator, in which he essentially admitted um, that The Spectator had been functioning not as a news organization in the way that we think of it, um, but as an advocacy uh, organization, and that he had engaged in a bit of self-censorship uh, himself. Um, th this uh, op-ed concludes with him stating that he still believes that uh, Selkowitz was raped, and he describes Nungesser in a, in a remarkable uh, phrase as statistically guilty. Um, that's not a phrase I've ever heard uh, uh, before, but it sort of suggests how these issues are being approached uh, on, uh, on campus. So that's the first area, I think, where uh, this should be a broader concern, that academic freedom is in ways both intentional, but I think in many ways unintentional. There's no, you know, there's no sense that, that the spectator's way of discussing this was intentionally suppressed, but you see a, a, a theme of self-censorship here um, has, uh, has occurred. The second way that this uh, uh, issue should be of broader importance is the question of how colleges and universities are training future citizens, future lawyers, future legislators, um, in terms of how they conceive of due process. Uh, and here, particularly timely given the uh, CGR's uh, uh, publication of its review of this piece, is the Rolling Stone article um, on, uh, at uh, the University of Virginia. This, as we all know, is a, has become a discredited story. Rolling Stone has formally withdrawn uh, the, uh, the piece. What's most interesting, though, I think, about this article is not necessarily the journalistic failures, although the journalistic failures are quite uh, extreme, but the reaction that it triggered on the University of Virginia campus. This was certainly what most interested me. During the lacrosse case, which was 2006-2007, um, virtually the only voices of reason uh, on the Duke uh, campus were the student body. Um, the student government took basically a dispassionate view. 
They ended the lacrosse case calling for the university to change its policies to give more due process to accuse. The university administration rejected every one of these uh, suggestions. Uh, the campus newspaper won several national awards for, um, for student newspapers for its coverage of the case, which was you know, basically down the middle and, and, and really, really quite well uh, done. That was not the case at UVA. Um, this was a, a story, for those of you who followed it, that fell apart very, very quickly, in part because the Rolling Stone reporter, Sabrina Erdely, didn't talk to anyone, essentially, except for the accuser. The Washington Post uh, did speak to lots of other people, and so within a couple of weeks, the story had essentially uh, crumbled. It didn't crumble because of anything that the campus newspaper did. Indeed, the campus newspaper seemed to view its role as ignoring the due process uh, concerns that were raised um, uh, in the UVA uh, case. The then editor uh, of the newspaper, uh, Catherine Ripley, after the Washington Post published a series of articles that essentially destroyed the, the credibility of the accuser, started sending out these tweets with the hashtag I stand with Jackie, the accuser's uh, pseudonym. Not exactly the kind of approach that you would expect from the editor of a down the middle uh, newspaper. And she also uh, 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 pronounced herself disgusted with the Washington Post coverage, which was the coverage that essentially exposed uh, uh, the hoax. One of the lower level staffers uh, on the paper published this piece in Politico in which she uh, worried that fact checking uh, might define the narrative and that would be a huge mistake. Generally, we like to think of journalists as engaged in determining the facts and then building the narrative rather than uh, the, the reverse. And in one of these, you know, you can't make it up uh, approach, uh, a month after uh, 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 this woman, Julia Hortz's uh, op-ed appeared, she was elected the new editor-in-chief of the UVA student uh, newspaper. So I suspect we'll see continuing coverage uh, uh, in this regard. And then how did the campus leadership among students, again, these are future legislators, the people who are going to be writing future laws about due process relating to campus sexual assault respond. There was this document. This was not a document uh, compiled by victims' rights advocates. It was part of a coalition arrangement that included the student government, that included the first year organization, the representative of all first year students uh, at UVA, and the fraternity council uh, at UVA. Their response to this event, which again didn't occur, there was no sexual assault in this case, there was a rush to judgment that, uh, that got overturned, was not to call for additional due process. It was to make these recommendations to the uh, UVA Board of Visitors, which were not going to be adopted, but nonetheless it gives a sense of what student sentiment was. The first was to set up a proposal uh, to give accusers, but not accused, uh, the right uh, to counsel in sexual assault cases. This, among other things, would be a violation of Title IX, and therefore UVA couldn't do it if they wanted uh, to do it. And then the second, a quite remarkable proposal, um, to have the UVA leadership lobby the Virginia State Legislature to make rape trials, all rape trials, in the state of Virginia secret uh, on grounds that this might, theoretically it might, uh, encourage more accusers to come forward. It might also encourage more prosecutors to engage in shady uh, behavior. We have open trials in the United States for a reason. This was the reaction, again, of the student leadership to an event that did not occur. It was not as if the Rolling Stone profile uncovered this horrific event that necessitated a, uh, a response. So where are we going to wind up with all of this? Um, I am by training a historian. I like to think in terms of historical analogies. Um, and to me, the closest analogy to what we're seeing here um, uh, comes from around 30 years ago um, with the child daycare cases of the 1980s and early 1990s. These swept uh, the nation, and it was a similar sort of offense. There clearly were daycare rapes uh, in the 80s. There was essentially no regulation uh, of, uh, of, of this industry. Um, but there was also a sense that this was such a horrific uh, crime because as we all know, kids don't lie about these sorts of things, that when juries came back with not guilty verdicts, this required changing procedures to make sure that the desired result occurred. And that's essentially what happened uh, in Massachusetts, in California, uh, in New Jersey. There was a conviction of innocent or almost certainly innocent people as a result of these flawed procedures. There eventually was a major backlash, um, a recognition, I think, by broad elements in society that the weakening of due process had gone too far. 
And I suspect that that's what we'll see on college campuses as well, that in five or 10 years, there'll be a recognition that to find the truth, good or bad, um, we need fair procedures for both sides. Um, but until that point, uh, we're in a period of, uh, of flux where I think uh, the, uh, the short-term prognosis is not a particularly positive one. So that's all I have to say. I'm hopeful for questions. I, I can't imagine that what I've said is so clearly correct that it doesn't merit question. So in addition to these procedural concerns, it seems that there's, uh, there's some evidentiary concerns too, at least tribunals, and that oftentimes there isn't a real investigation, but it just happens to uh, be a considerable each party brings the table, which kind of begs the question of whether college tribunals are fit in the first place to evaluate these kinds of uh, offenses. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Right. In, in an ideal world, you know, if you sort of ask me what could rewrite the law. It seems to me that the, that the far better approach would be to have the criminal justice system handle these issues, um, to uh, have colleges work more closely with local law enforcement to handle these issues, and to have college administrators do what they do best, which is you know, engage in counseling and uh, uh, deal with sort of victims advocacy on, uh, on campus. That's not the law, and it's not likely to be the law anytime uh, soon. And so given that, it seems to me that colleges and universities have, you know, I guess to some extent, a moral obligation, but more broadly than that, an obligation to the truth to set up procedures that are most likely to yield uh, the truth in the end. But even there, there's only so much that colleges and universities can, can do. I mean, they cannot subpoena. They cannot compel testimony uh, under oath. And in these sorts of cases where very often the critical evidence can be electronic uh, 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 evidence, this is evidence that both sides can either produce or not produce. If they don't produce it, there's nothing that the college or, or, or university can do. Um, colleges have started moving towards that Harvard Law uh, piece that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, um, the so-called single investigator model. So uh, the, the White House is pushing this. They, they've pushed this since 2014. So colleges will hire a trained investigator, frequently someone with law enforcement uh, experience. But the investigator, who is a, a, a contract employee, will serve effectively as the equivalent of the police officer, the jury, and the judge in a criminal case. That is, that the investigator will do an investigation, request information from both parties. The investigator will then determine whether or not an offense has occurred, and the investigator will then recommend an appropriate punishment. Um, if you have a fair-minded investigator, this might be a better system than the Stanford system, but you know, we live in a country where we don't assume the existence of fair-minded uh, investigators. Um, so you point out um, a, a sort of skew that you see, like uh, Huffington Post and BuzzFeed, these other things, where D people is automatic. However, some of the language you've used, sort of referring to the women who come forward as accusers, referring to Emma Silkowitz as aggressive, and even comparing adult women in higher education to brainwashed toddlers in the, um, in the daycare cases in the 80s, um, I feel like this sort of implies that we should be giving more credence to the men who are accused and less credence to the women instead of actually giving them equal credence, which I think is pretty emblematic of the sort of overall way um, if, I am, uh, if I implied that college women were the equivalent of, of brainwashed toddlers, um, I withdraw the uh, allegation. I was, but I was suggesting how society um, had responded. With regards to Sulkowitz, I think someone who has given a number of interviews has been aggressive. I had a very difficult tenure fight at Brooklyn College. I gave a number of interviews as part of that tenure fight. I would consider that an aggressive response, and I have described myself as aggressive in that respect. So I don't really see an approach. With regards to accusers, legally that's what the women are. I mean, they, you know, I think that one of the issues with rape is that for a victim's rights advocate, it seems to me perfectly appropriate to describe a woman who files a sexual assault complaint as a survivor. I mean, there are lots of sort of good reasons from that from the victim's rights uh, standpoint. 
from the legal standpoint or from the media standpoint, that seems to me not appropriate at all. Because if there is a survivor, those of you who follow the UVA case, um, in the uh, uh, press conference of the police chief um, in Charlottesville a couple of weeks ago, he repeatedly referred to the woman in that case, Jackie, as a survivor. A survivor of what? There is no evidence of any crime in the University of Virginia case. So calling her a survivor implies that there has been something, that something has happened to her, that there is some reason to believe that a crime occurred. So I think in this case, language does actually matter. And one of the reasons I was so critical of the Cuomo budget language is precisely for this reason. If you're writing into law that a woman who files an accusation in a college proceeding is automatically, under the law, a victim or a survivor, you've already decided that a crime has occurred. And this is a case, those of you who have taken criminal law know, where frequently the defense is consent. Um, and that uh, 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 defense is sort of gone. On the issue of rape culture, um, I gave a talk uh, a, a few months ago at Ohio University on this general topic. Um, and I got a question on rape culture, and I asked the student what he meant by rape culture. So I'll ask you what you meant by rape culture. I mean, in general. And I'm not putting you on the spot. Yeah, no, I know, that's cool. Um, I mean, you can point to certain, like, super liberal news sites that always sweep it to the side of women um, saying there was a rape. But in general, any time a woman comes forward and says she was raped, the first question is, well, what was she wearing? Can we believe her? Was she leading him on? any other crime, which is when someone comes forward and says that something bad happens to them, you may not immediately say, like, oh, I completely believe you 100%, but your first response isn't to say, well, I don't know if I believe you. Um, and, we know, and so many women don't report their rapes, and we know this. Right. There are statistics that women Correct. don't report their rapes because they know they, they fear that people won't believe them, which doesn't happen for other crimes. And as long as this, as long as this is the case that people, particularly with rape as opposed to other crimes, don't even want to come forward because they're so confident that that's a completely different definition of rape culture than I got in Ohio. It's, a, I think, a much more reasonable definition. The Ohio definition that I got was that it implied that uh, drunk sex could never be rape, which, of course, is not, uh, uh, is not true. W one of the, the, the I think, the, the, the problems that I have with, with this phrase, and one reason why you didn't hear me use it one way or the other in, in, in the talk, is that it seems to me that you can handle process issues without coming down on one side or another about whether or not you believe there is a rape uh, uh, culture. That is that, that you know, for better or worse, um, the criminal justice uh, system is designed to get at the truth. There have been you know, consistent adjustments in rape law over the last 30 years. There will be con consistent adjustments over the next 10 years. It's not a perfect system. But it's a whole lot better than the Stanford system uh, uh, is. And so I think that you know, to sort of toss away the, the principles of the criminal justice system for this reconfigured system that's coming under heavy public and government pressure um, is, uh, is problematic. And my chief critique of BuzzFeed, um, Huffington Post, and especially the New York Times and as you can see, if you sort of look at what I've written on this issue, is not necessarily that they believe the accusers, although generally they, they do, they're sort of entitled to that. It's that they're writing, these articles are almost always being written about Title IX complaints being filed to OCR. And the basis of the Title IX complaint is that the university procedure is flawed in fundamental ways against the accuser in such a way that it constitutes a violation of Title IX. And it seems to me that if you're covering that as a reporter, you have an obligation to describe what the procedure is. You can't assume that your typical reader, I'd like to believe this is true, but it's not, um, is going to go to the college website, click on 6,000 links, because colleges don't make these procedures easy to find, and figure out what the procedure is that, that has triggered the complaint. So if you're, my, my central critique of the media on this issue is that if you're going to cover procedure, you have, to, you have to sort of describe what the procedure is. Because my sense is that most readers, you know, probably not most of the people in this room, but mo a general reader, doesn't have a clear sense of how different the procedures, the procedural rules are on colleges as they are in terms of the criminal justice system. Yes. Thank you. 
Right. Um, uh, yeah, two, two interesting questions. On the first, it's absolutely true. I mean, you know, public, uh, private colleges have the right to define you know, disciplinary behavior as they see fit. I mean, we could go to the, the ultra extreme and be Brigham Young and say, you know, if you drink or if you have premarital sex, you have to get kicked off. I mean, I certainly not want to be recommending uh, uh, that. My concern on this issue is that colleges have taken a term, that quote that I used from the Yale procedures where they say we're using a more expansive definition of sexual assault, they've taken a term that I think, thanks to the work of victims' rights advocates and thanks to the work in general of the media, most Americans now have a basic understanding of what constitutes sexual assault or rape. I mean, there may be disagreements around the margins, but you know, it's a term that most Americans understand. Certainly it's a term that's understood in the law of all 50 states. And to use that to define other things is problematic. So you know, if a college wants to you know, forbid all kinds of other things, fine. But don't call it sexual assault. And you know, don't sort of redefine the, the, the term. On the issue of due process, there, there is, I think, you, the, the most favorable interpretation here is that there is an assumption. The assumption, I think, is a dangerous assumption. And I don't think there's any statistical data to, to prove it. And the assumption seems to be this. It is that if you set up a college system that is more likely in the end not to treat both parties respectfully, but is more, and again, this is the assumption, that is more likely to yield a culpable finding, that is to more likely in the end to yield the student accused of rape being found culpable, that more victims of sexual assault on campus will come forward and report the crime. It seems to me there's, there's a lot of steps between step A and step you know, F when you're getting to this. And there are a lot of other ways that colleges, if they want more uh, 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 victims to come forward, can do that without eviscerating due, uh, due process. I mean, you know, every college and university now, thanks to OCR mandates, has a Title IX coordinator. There are lots of you know, things in terms of atmospherics that colleges uh, can do to, uh, to come forward. And with regards to the issue of rape culture, which, you know, again, I think you know, this is a big issue uh, on this front, regardless of your opinion of whether or not there is a rape culture or how intense the rape culture is, it seems to me very, very hard to make an argument that rape culture is more intense on college campuses than it is outside of college uh, uh, campuses. And so you know, the, it, to the extent that this is, that this is a problem, you would think that the problem would want to be directed off campus, and yet that, that's essentially ignored um, within, this, uh, within this approach. Hi. Um, Hi. So, I guess in the discussion of Title IX, um, so the point is, right, there can't be an educational environment where women, Correct. gender non conforming people feel like they can't Correct. participate. Correct. Who can say whether that's the environment? You know what I mean? Like you're, Well, I think we, we, we've gotten into a bit of problem if, if we simply adopt an identity uh, politics approach uh, to this. Certainly everyone you know, is entitled to their own opinion on these issues. Under the law, um, suggesting that this is an issue that could only be decided um, by uh, if we want to go sort of extreme, you know, poor women of color would seem to me just, you know, I mean, we can't, we can't have that. I mean, there has to be a sort of generalized uh, uh, standard. The question here is whether or not even adopting this definition, I mean, the, the definition that you've offered is the law of the land. I mean, it predates the Obama administration, although the Obama administration has uh, dramatically expanded it. Having adopted this as a definition, which is, you know, sexual assault has to be treated as a Title IX violation. Do we need to have procedures that are set up in such a way that make it far less likely that the result is going to be an accurate result? I mean, the one reason why I raised the Stanford and sort of hammering the Stanford issue is that I don't see how anyone can have confidence on the basis of that procedure that the result that an ARP panel produces is the accurate result. 
Um, and so, you know, again, even if you want to take the Obama approach on this, this issue, that's not an argument, it seems to me. And again, I speak as a white gay man, so uh, you know, th there is some element here. Um, th there is, um, you know, it, it's, it, it seems to me that that's not an argument for, for weakening process. And once we go down that road, that strikes me as a pretty, I, I don't think that's a road that we really want to be going down. Oh, oh, absolutely. In, in private universities, it seems to me, have, have a right to hold their members to you know, essentially any, you know, any non-discriminatory standard that they want. I mean, I raised that BYU example. You know, it's a kind of comical example in one respect. But you know, any private university in the country, if they want, can say that consuming one ounce of alcohol is a disciplinary offense and you'll get you know, kicked out. I mean, that's perfectly you know, fine in terms of the, uh, in terms of the standard. The question then is how do you adjudicate that standard? And what it seems to me we're seeing on campuses is a, is a fundamentally unfair adjudication. The definition is whatever a private university wants. Obviously, there are, there are distinctions in terms of what a public university can or cannot do. But yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, and it gets back to this, this earlier question. If, if a private university wants to say, you know, again, I'm, the, the BYU example doesn't really address your question precisely, but I mean, you, you sort of see what I'm saying. That premarital sex is a disciplinary offense that, that uh, you can expel. That's not a standard that I suspect Columbia will be adopting anytime soon, but it would be in their rights to adopt it. What would not be in their rights would be if BYU had this uh, standard and set up a procedure where a student accused of having premarital sex essentially had no way to defend him or herself of the, uh, of the the allegation, and that I think is what we're seeing. Uh, what we're seeing here, yes. But, you know, given that most universities have resource constraints that I would say are more significant than those of you know, the government in seeking right. to prosecute crimes, is it, wouldn't it be reasonable for a university, public or private, to say reaching you know, a level of unreasonable doubt is just not feasible? Because we don't have subpoena powers, we don't have other powers of the government, right. so we're using a lower standard. Um, well, well, again, very few universities use the, um, the, the, the reasonable doubt standard. I mean, they used the sort of clear and convincing standard before. That, that, that's an intriguing argument. Um, it's not an argument that I think you'll see many universities use because universities want students to come to the, uh, to the campus. Um, so you, know, you can't sort of say uh, to a parent, we're going to spend $60,000, uh, so, yeah, spend $60,000 a year to send your son or daughter here. But we won't be able to give them a, a, a kind of comprehensive adjudication process because we have limitations. I mean, so that, I think, is a, it's a PR non-starter in terms of the university. The question of resources, though, is, I think, it's a legitimate, it's a, it's a really good question. There have been proposals um, at some smaller colleges. I haven't seen any proposals like this um, at sort of large universities to create consolidated investigating arms. So you may have, like, a, a group of six or eight small colleges and they'll, they'll hire, they'll create you know, the equivalent of a sexual assault police force for these uh, colleges and that will deal with the resource issue. Again, the preference would be to allow people who are trained to investigate these things to investigate them, but at least that's better than what the Stanford procedure is. So I think that the resource issue, it may be a concern, but the resource issue can be, uh, can be handled. And it doesn't seem to me a, um, a legitimate argument for lowering the standard. And of course, the other argument you can make on the resource issue is if we're not getting the full range of information because we're limited in resources, we don't want to lower the standard because we're increasing the likelihood of an incorrect finding. I, I don't think there, there are aspects of this that, are, that, that you can see a similarity to rape shield laws, but it's 
far, far more extreme. I mean, there are campuses that now make the claim that any previous uh, uh, sexual behavior by the accuser is inadmissible. And there's no rape shield law in the country that has such a standard. I mean, there always are, uh, there always are exceptions to the, uh, to the uh, uh, process. So there is something like, I mean, there is sort of the rape shield uh, uh, process that's, that's sort of brought in. But I don't see rape shield law necessarily as dealing with the kind of evidentiary or procedural problems here. I mean, rape shield law essentially is an attempt to deal with you know, what was what were perceived correctly as unfair attempts to sort of blame the victim in in criminal justice uh, uh, approaches. And you could you could construct a a a positive and I, I think correct justification for rape shield law. It's very hard, it seems to me, to construct a positive justification for saying we're going to investigate a sexual assault and we're not going to have any method of bringing in electronic evidence that's vital to determining whether or not an, an assault uh, uh, occurred. And one thing on this point, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out I'm very suspicious about the one in five uh, uh, figure or really anything close to that. But to the extent that that's true, there are lots of things that colleges and universities could do um, to address this problem that aren't procedural. I mean, colleges and universities could go sort of all London CCTV and put you know, cameras in every public place on the university to provide more evidence. In theory, colleges and universities, I mean, when you, when you use a Columbia email or when I use a Brooklyn email, you know, there, there is a little disclaimer saying it's searchable by the university under certain circumstances. They, you know, they could sort of search their email. There are all kinds of these sort of privacy issues that may be problematic in other, uh, in other respects, but could, be, could address the problem without getting at these procedural uh, issues. Right. That 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 in general is uh, is the sort of is the more traditional argument in favor of the of the preponderance of evidence uh, threshold, and I think the, the there there is a problem with that in two respects. One we don't know, and one we sort of do. Does anyone in this room, and I'm going to suspect the answer is no, although maybe it'll be it might be some Oregon people, remember the name David Wu? I am a hist. I am a historian of Congress. How quickly they forget. Wu was an Oregon congressman who resigned in disgrace from his seat in 2011 um, after it came out that in the 70s at Stanford he had admitted to sexually assaulting his then girlfriend and had gotten a slap on the wrist. That's a testimony of how these things are viewed differently now and then. So the punishment, you can say, yes, it's just expulsion. But in fact, it tends to be more. It means you can't get into another school. It means you're likely not to be able to get additional jobs. So there is a sort of, the, the punishment is more, uh, you know, it's not, we're going to kick you out of Columbia and you can now go into Harvard next uh, year. Now, of course, if the student is actually a rapist, the student should be in jail. I mean, so, so simply being expelled is not a sufficient punishment. But if it's a false conviction, a loss of potential livelihood and tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of earning power is a substantial punishment. So if colleges are going to make that sort of punishment, it seems to me they have an obligation to do what they can to get it right before coming with, uh, with the approach. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for Thank staying you around. Thank you for coming and participating. Thank you.